This week in history, we take you back to 1991, when the silence of the lambs swept the boards at the Oscars. Ian Woosnam just about to take the Masters, and a young 15-year-old called Tiger Woods about to register his first US amateur success. In horse racing, a ratsy and generous of the stars of the day, and in April, the Grand National is all about Seagram. The 1991 Grand National was sponsored by Seagram and it featured a little horse called Seagram. Up against a stellar lineup, including the previous year's record breaking winner, Mr. Frisk, the dual runner up, Durham Edition, the future Whitbread winner, Docklands Express, and the dual Welsh national winner and fancy Bonanza Boy. And then there was Seagram. We've come down to the West Country to speak to the people who knew the horse best. His jockey, Nigel Hawke, former jockey and assistant trainer, Paul Nichols, and perhaps the man who knew him best, his groom, stable lad, Graham Piper. But this is a story that didn't start at David Barron's West Country yard. No, it's a story that began in New Zealand. The New Zealand project was a good project. It was David's idea. Um, the horses were a lot cheaper in New Zealand and it was just as cheap to fly them, to buy them in New Zealand and fly them over. So um, he, he started off with a few and it, it, it took off. They were all, they weren't, they were very slow horses. They used to win all their bumpers and then they're, they're, um, they weren't brilliant over hurdles but then they went chasing and they came to their own then. That's when they were at their best. Yeah, so uh, it was quite good because we used to go to Manchester Airport uh, and there'd be 24, 26 horses come over on a plane and we used to drive onto the runway and the plane would land, we'd watch it circle round and you'd get your cows, your sheep, event horses and then we used to get the New Zealand horses used to come out then in uh, crates of three and we put them onto the box and then a long old drive back to Devon again which is five or six hours straight back to the field, let them out in the field, and they used to lie down for two days. And uh, we just used to leave them, they'd lie down, and then they'd get, after a couple of days, we'd go around, sort them all out, we'd bring them all in. They were all broken in already, like, you know, so um, they are quite easy to handle. And uh, they all used to get gelded, then back out into the field again, and then he'd bring them in, and they'd be all stood there looking out over the stable and the boss used to say to us, take your pick, which one do you want? Well, funny enough, Seagram wasn't a particularly big horse and I think um, Hugh Davis may have started riding him in his first couple of rides. He used to share the rides at the Barrenhouses with me and then I ended up getting to ride Seagram a few times and he, he won quite a few novice hurdles and I can remember one in, winning a really good handicap hurdle with him one day at Sandown and then be absolutely bolted in. It wasn't particularly big, but oh my God, he was strong and he used to jump very well. And then he went chasing. And I actually can remember one of the worst falls I ever had on a horse uh, on him one day at Wolverhampton. Uh, he was just a bit too brave over fences to start with, but eventually he came good. And, you know, I think I won probably five races on it one time. Um, we had a really good relationship, good jumper. Um, and as is well published, so I, so I broke my leg in 1989 and actually had a year on the sidelines, which Nigel Hort took over riding him. I, I retired from racing. Um, race riding because you know the injury and my weight and one thing other. and so Nigel was then riding Seagram. Early memories when I started at David's I mean he was a good hurdler he won one two nine races I think he won at Sandown but not on the record but you know he was he was a decent horse um, he certainly wasn't the biggest in the world a bit like Tiger Robe between the two but he was built like a little tank um, 
a mouth. He had no mouth. He was a difficult ride. Uh, he used to pull like a train. And to be fair, I think it was either myself or Andy Hobbs rode him most of the time because he, he just wasn't an easy ride at all, mainly because he was a low tank, very, very keen all the time. First couple of seats were good. I mean, I think I looked after him for oh, just over two years. And I think he was out the first four, twice maybe. I remember the first time I took him racing was at Chapstow and he ran the Mercedes-Benz, which was the first race of the season on the t on BBC. He ran in that and he won that. And then he went to Ascot and he won there as well. He won a short head there. Then they ran him in the Hennessy, I think. And he didn't run so good in the Hennessy. And then a few more runs that year and he ended up going to Cheltenham for the Ritz. Uh, and he got denied by a head there by Big Son, Richard Dunwoody, David Nicholson, be as a head there, which is a bit gutting at the time, but it was a great run for for a, for a horse from a from the West Country, like you know. I would never miss it, but most probably Richard Dunwoody outrode me. Just got touched on the line in the Ritz, um, which for a young lad takes some bearing. It really did. I was just getting to the end of my what I call my conditional career. My claim was just about to be lost, which is great to get to that stage. But big winners like that make a hell of a difference. Obviously, so running so well in the Ritz, he went up in the weights, and that's obviously why Roddy sort of started the following season, takes some pound off it, which is unfortunately happens, which is fair enough. Um, didn't quite work, and to be fair to David and Eric, Sir Eric Parker, the owner, I think they put me back on him at Cheltenham on New Year's Day when we won the full mile. And we, we just then had a golden, golden, golden Deep period. On the far side, Bonanza Boy putting in a great man to work on the outside. Seagram over half length advantage. Seagram will length advantage. Seagram from Bonanza Boy. Seagram is going to win it. 15 yards to run. Seagram has won it. Seagram has won the ASW handicap chase. It was a four goal chase on New Year's Day at Cheltenham. He went for that and he bolted up. And I remember coming back and the next day when we went back to the yard, the boss was like, right, this is it, this is our national losses. Which was, which was you know, you think, oh, a, little, a yard down in the West Country, all of a sudden we've got a national horse. And, he, and all the papers were saying he was quite well fancied. And, and, uh, and then we went to the festival and he won there. He beat Carl Villa Howe, he won the Ritz, and that nearly put him favourite for the national, I think. And it, all, it was all happening as, you know, you wouldn't think a little yard down in the West Country, miles away from anywhere, would have such a, you know, opportunity to win a big race like that. And not even, even myself and Nigel. It was just like, it was just all happening really quick, like, you know. Racing to the final fence now. Seagram from outside edge. Carvilla Hall's third. The final fence now. Seagram lands in the lead from outside edge and Carvilla Hall. Carvilla Hall moves into second. Seagram the leader from Carvilla Hall. Seagram from Carvilla Hall has been racing to the closing stages. Seagram is holding the top wave as they race to the line. Seagram is going to win the Ritz Club National Hunt Handicap Chase. Seagram is the winner. Carvilla Hall is second. Third is going to be outside edge. Because we were a little bit worried about the health in the yard after Cheltenham, the horseman from Cheltenham straight down to the second yard at David Barron's and between Graham, Andy Hobbs, uh, who was the head lad myself and myself, we only three had anything to do with that horse at all. Me and Andy rode him out every day and Graham did the horse all the time. Um, I keep telling Graham he should have been champion trainer because at the time he had another horse called Rockfall down with him as a companion and he nearly won at Liverpool as well so it's it, it, whatever they did they did right but it was it's you know funny I was talking to Roddy Green about it this morning and Roddy was at the yard as well and it was it was a, a marvellous time of your life and it was just a marvellous lot of teamwork around us mm. a great but lot there was a great lot of lads and oh, the build up was great it started well it started about two about a week before I remember going back to my little my village which is half an hour from Mr Barron's and I, I went for a beer and, and all, the, all the locals were there, all the lads from the village and of course it's the Grand National and everyone wants to bet in the Grand National so they were all going on about Seagram this and Seagram that and then that really sort of thinking this course might have half a chance and then the local TV would turn up and they would do their little bits on him and I remember I left on the Friday, yeah Friday, Friday morning I left to go to Aintree and uh, the TV cameras, the West Country TV cameras are there to see him go into the horse box. 
and I left down because we had another runner in the race, Mr. Christian. So I took both of them up to Aintree with Daz. And uh, when you're driving up there, you're really thinking, this is really happening. Like, you know, we, you know we've got a good chance. 11 is Seagram, ridden by Nigel Hawke, 25 years old, first ride in the race. Then. I know it's my first ride in the national, but there was no apprehension or anything like that. I knew I had to go and do the job. Remember, this horse wasn't 20, 25, he was second, third favourite. For a young lad, you could say that was a lot of pressure, but it wasn't pressure because I had so much confidence in the horse, and what would be, will be. Back then, you still had to jump round, and I just basically thought the old story, go hunting for the first circuit, which exactly that I did. Second race, then try to become a jockey and get me into the race, which happened there as well. It was very strange watching the race. I, uh, I kind of kept myself to myself and kept out of the way, but I couldn't. He was only a little horse, he was only 16 hands, he was tiny, and you couldn't really see him. With, with all the 40 runners, like, you know, he was stuck in the middle of them all and you couldn't really see him. And then they, I remember I was stood not far off of the water jump and I see him jump the water jump and he's like middle, middle to back, I suppose, when he jumped the water jump. And I thought, well, at least he's still there. Nigel's still on him, so we're halfway there anyway. <laughs> they went out on the second circuit <clears throat> and I think it was the, the, the ditch where he first got, they started to string out a bit. And he wasn't a fast horse, so they went really quick in the first circuit. And when they slowed the pace up on the second circuit, he, could, he, got, he was into his rhythm. And uh, he started to pass a few horses, and then they started to slow down in front of him. And I think he was mentioned jumping the ditch on the second circuit. And that's when I kind of uh, started watching it then. And I could see him just on the outside of everyone. And he was just, he was just jumping for fun. And Nigel got into a great rhythm. And, I remember him jumping beaches and thought, well, that's another one out of the way. And then it was it, it was like, oh, he's, he's going to run where? He's going to finish fourth, <coughs> fourth or fifth, and he's run a blind. He's going to get touch what he's going to get around. And then I remember looking up the straight, and they turned in, and I looked at the screen like as well, and Garrison's van has kicked on. And I thought, well, oh, my, it's going to finish second. Like, oh, it's going to be what a day. Like, have a horse, he would just look after the horse that runs in the Grand Ice, so it's going to finish second. Brilliant. And they've jumped the second last, they've jumped the last, and I've looked up the track, and I, you can see him come around the elbow where I was stood, because the fence is just outside. I come around the elbow, I see Garrison Tarana come around the elbow, and I see my little lad come around the elbow on the outside of him. And it just looked like he took off. And I looked at the screen, and I looked up the track, and then before I knew it, he was five lengths clear and Nigel was celebrating and it was just like, wow, it's just, it's just happened, like, you know. And uh, what made it even better was I used to share a house with Nigel. So the build-up was, um, was great all the way up to the national, like, you know. So when he went past the line, it was just like, it was unbelievable for all of us because I think Nigel was still claiming at the time. You know, they could have put anyone on that horse, but Mr. Barons and Mrs. Barons had kept faith in Nigel. And, yeah, it paid out well in the end. Well, I always remember watching it um, as the horse went out, in Seagram went out into the second circuit. I think, and really, he could, he, he's travelling really well. You only watch your own horse. Very much like when I was watching Neptune Colange, you're watching your own horse, and I can remember Seagram was just picking them off, and Nigel was giving him quite a cool ride, and you, you had that belief, oh, my God, I think he could win. He actually could win, and as the race went on and further and further, you got more and more belief, and, of course, when he, he went by the winning post in front, it's... It's just it's something you'll never forget, really. It was an amazing feeling and it was good for the team down in Devon. And I can remember then we all started partying that night at the local pub. Seagram came back the next morning in the normal parade. And when the other went on, it was just a surreal experience. And really, that was then one of the things that, you know, I've been heavily involved in the training of him. Sort of got me kick-started in the training myself. And I, a few months afterwards, left and came up to ditch it and started training myself. So really, Seagram had a big part of my life and a big part of, get me hooked on training and, and, and watching how things went with the racing. Well, everybody takes the mickey at me because they reckon I did it about 20 yards too soon, but yeah, the race was won by then, wasn't it? So, it, yeah, it's a great feeling. Um, yeah, it was. It's you never do it again. And I remember after the race, silly old thing, I locked myself in the loo for five, ten minutes, only for a simple reason. Everybody and anybody becomes your friend. You've got the press, you've got the whole world there. And I just wanted five, ten minutes to think about it, what's just happened, which was a good thing to do.
it's hard to explain the emotions really. It's like, you know, you look after that horse every day and uh, the things I, you know, you, you had to give up things because he was laying in this different yard. So I, I didn't go racing for a month. And, you know, I, I didn't have weekends off because I used to go and spend it to make sure I was the only one that could go down and because no one else wanted to um, give him a bug or anything. So for that one month, and the emotion, well, they went by the window, and it was just unreal. And I went up to Nigel and he's going, you never guess what, we won. <laughs> and I was like, we did. <laughs> and uh, it was great, like, even after the race, when I took him back to the to the dog testing box, um, I was washed him off and leading him around. And fair play to Jenny Pittman. She came up and uh, she said, well done, give him a pat, checked his legs to make sure he was all right and there was no cuts on him, which is, it's an amazing thing, you know, for somebody who's just, it's one, I know she won a Gold Cup, but it would have been a massive double if she won the Gold Cup and the National. But fair play to her, she came out and made sure the horse was all right and said, well done to us. And, yeah, it was great. I always tell the story, it was me, David Barons, and Jimmy Frost on the way home. And we got to Birmingham, they actually took the wrong turn. We ended up in London near enough that night. I don't know Frosty ever remember that, but yeah, usual thing. We, we got home, had a few drinks at the pub. Um, next day, we celebrated down in King's Richard, local town, and um, yeah, you're in dream world for a day or two. And then I was thinking, oh, we're going to stay out tonight and have a little bit of a party. And uh, Dad says to me, right, you've got an hour. Get him ready, we're going back to the box and we're going home. Which is like a six hour drive back to Devon. And I remember sitting in the horse box and driving down the motorway and people beeping at you. Because David Barron's written on them. And, uh, and people beeping at you, waving at you. And it was, uh, yeah, it was really, really weird. But it's uh, something I'll never forget anyway. Watch live racing now on RacingTV.com.